Thank you. Uh, we are now moving on for further questions, communities and local government. First question, Alexandra Stewart, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what impact the Scottish Budget had on local authorities. Cabinet Secretary Eileen Campbell. The 2019-20 Local Government Finance Settlement provides an increase in revenue funding of £298.5 million and capital spending of £207.8 million. Taken together with the actual increases in council tax, the overall additional funding available in 1920 will amount to over £600 million, a real terms increase of 3.8%. Local authorities are empowered to make and take decisions to utilise this significant package of funding to ensure they deliver positive outcomes that the people in their local communities and across Scotland expect and deserve. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Figures produced by SPICE revealed that there was a nationwide 3.1% reduction in real terms, which translated to in excess of £300 million in cuts, which meant that every single local authority in Scotland had to radically reduce services. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, when will the Scottish Government recognise the needs of local councils and support them accordingly to ensure that they have adequate resources to support the communities which they serve? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah. Um, I just want to remind uh, Mr Stewart about the answer that I gave him, which said that overall we will be giving a real terms increase of 3.8%. And can I also gently remind Mr Stewart that if we'd followed his party's tax plan, plans, mm -hmm. 500 million would have had to come out of public services. Perhaps it might have been even the local government budget. So we'll take no lessons from the Conservatives about how to marshal uh, our budget. Instead, we'll continue to focus on supporting local authorities and making sure that we can work in partnership with them to deliver the outcomes that the people of Scotland deserve. Yeah. Yeah. Alec Rowley. President officer, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary accepts that there were £400 million of new financial commitments placed on local government, and that's where the discrepancy between Mr Stewart's figures and your own's come in. Does she agree that we actually need to get a better relationship with local government and we should actually start to work closer now in looking at next year's budget? Cabinet Secretary. I actually believe that we do have a fairly strong and positive relationship with local uh, authorities. My regular uh, meetings that I have with uh, his colleague, Alison Everson, uh, has embedded that partnership uh, further. Uh, and we will continue to work with them in partnership around budget issues. And of course, recognising that we're all facing uh, challenges that are uh, financial. Uh, but I should also remind Alec Rowley that with the commitments that we had that we worked through in partnership with local authorities, such as early learning and childcare and health and social care, that we have provided and recognised that within the budget settlement. Uh, but I do take on board the, the, the interest that Mr Rowley has in local government, uh, but we'll continue to work in partnership, which is constructive partnership, and we will continue to work with local authorities and COSLA uh, around future budget uh, uh, management. Question two is withdrawn. Question three, Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting housing regeneration and community empowerment in the Almond Valley constituency. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government support, uh, supports activity in these areas in a number of different ways. The Scottish Government's affordable housing investment in West Lothian will be substantial at over £60 million over the current parliamentary period. In the Almond Valley constituency, we will be supporting the building of high-quality affordable housing in Livingston, Fault House, Polbeth, Pumferston, East Calder and West Calder. Through our Empowering Communities programme, the Regeneration uh, Capital Grant Fund and the recently announced Town Centre Fund, the Scottish Government is supporting locally uh, developed regeneration projects to tackle inequality and deliver inclusive growth in West Lothian. Angela Constance. Thank you. Uh, West Calder and Hardburn Community Development Trust have developed plans in consultation with the community for the old cooperative building in West Calder, uh, in essence to celebrate and use this asset of our heritage uh, to create a regeneration hub and a modern community facility. Uh, therefore, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could advise how local organisations can access and pursue regeneration funding, and will she meet with me to discuss further how local organisations across Ammon Valley and West Lothian can pursue Cabinet regeneration Secretary. funding? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I, I absolutely would uh, welcome a chance to meet with uh, Angela Constance to discuss what sound like incredibly exciting uh, uh, developments and projects in her 
our constituency. In terms of funding that we provide, the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund is one example of how we're working together with COSLA and local government to support community-led regeneration in our most disadvantaged and fragile communities. And we've recently announced projects that are due to be supported from that fund and we'll be planning to invite proposals from local authorities and other eligible applicants for 2020-21 funding soon. So happy to meet with uh, the member, happy to engage with her on the projects and happy to make sure that we can furnish her with the information uh, that will support her constituents. Mark Griffin, briefly. Thank you, President Officer. In a decision which clearly hasn't empowered communities, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me why the Government overruled its own reporters and rode roughshod over the views of my constituents, permitting the likely closure of the Bowness Road? Well, it's not about Ammon Valley constituency matters, but if you wish... Or we may I think it might be difficult also to furnish the member with uh, information when it's a, a live uh, application and a live uh, planning process. Uh, if he wants to raise those issues, then he can do so through the usual channels of writing to us. Question four, Linda Fabiani. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it can assist credit unions in encouraging the uptake of payroll saving. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government plays a key role in promoting the clear benefits of payroll saving schemes to employers and will continue to raise awareness of payroll deduction partnerships through, for example, the Scottish Business Pledge. Linda Fabiani. I um, thank um, the Cabinet Secretary very much for that answer. And can I ask her also to consider further and perhaps discuss with the UK Government and regulatory authorities how credit unions can be supported in expanding their operations further, perhaps in terms of enabling home ownership for savers and housing provision within their area of operation. Credit unions such as East Cobride Credit Union have ambitions towards helping their communities further, but they're constrained from doing so by the rules framework under which they work. I understand that, for example, in Ireland, derogations make it so that they can be much more involved in their local communities. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, and I thank uh, Linda Fabiani for her uh, question and recognise her clear uh, interest in this and, of course, enjoyed the uh, event that she uh, hosted in Parliament, which really did uh, show, show, shine a light on the good work that credit unions are doing across the country. And I'm aware of the fantastic work of East Kilbride's credit union. Most recently, I was interested to learn of their Home Start Deposit Scheme, which aims to help first-time buyers to get a foot on the property ladder. So we are aware that there's ambition there, eh, but it can't be met because of the regulatory eh, circumstances that we find ourselves in, which shows that eh, much of the eh, powers to do some of that innovation is reserved. Eh, so, of course, we will continue to push the UK government because it's unfortunate that we have this ambition from our credit unions, which is not yet met with the regulations, which we have no power to change but we'll continue to push the UK Government to make the changes that are necessary. Thank you. Question five, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government how many accessible homes have been built since May 2016. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, our annual outturn reports publish the percentage of affordable new build completions meeting housing for varying needs standards. Based on information returned for 2016-17, this shows that 91% of new build units met this standard, rising to 99% in 2017-18. Information relating to 2018-19 will be published later on in the year. Local authorities are responsible for assessing and meeting the housing needs in their areas. And I can confirm that we will publish guidance shortly for local authorities on the setting of local housing strategy targets to support the delivery of more wheelchair accessible housing across all tenures and to report annually on progress. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Minister for the full answer and I'll look at the official report just to pick up the detail of what he said but um, he will be aware that EHRC have recently concluded that disabled people in Scotland are being robbed of their dignity and independence due to a chronic shortage of accessible housing stating that many disabled people are unable to leave their homes or are forced to live in a single room which is leading to mental health pressures. The Minister will know that ACHR have called for at least a 10% of new build to be accessible. Um, at committee the Minister said the target was arbitrary, um, but could he commit today to request information on the volume of accessible housing that is currently available through local authorities and make this information available to Parliament? Minister. Um, President Officer, I've uh, been quite clear uh, to local authorities uh, around about the uh, delivery of wheelchair accessible housing. 
Um, I've said that while um, we have uh, the uh, benchmark figures that we have for housing, that we will be very flexible with local authorities who want to build wheelchair accessible homes or housing uh, with more bedrooms if there is a need in their areas. Uh, I recently uh, visited a new development in Cooper and Fife uh, in Ms Baker's region. Uh, where they've done very well in terms of new wheelchair accessible housing and houses with more bedrooms. Uh, and I think the key thing in all of this is to ensure that the local housing strategy targets are right. Uh, and I said that we will uh, publish shortly uh, that new strategy guidance. It will actually happen later on this week. We will be keeping a very close eye on all of this, but I would urge local authorities to use the flexibility that they have at this moment in subsidy to deliver for the people of their communities. Jeremy Balfour, briefly. Uh, Minister, would you recognise that accessible housing is not just about wheelchairs, but involves many disabilities? And would you also recognise that often for local authorities, it's an afterthought, and often houses have to be adapted once they are built, rather than having it at the front of planning so accessible houses can be built appropriately for people with many different types of disability. Minister. Uh, President officer, in my original answer, I, I highlighted that in 2016-17, 91% of houses that were delivered in the affordable programme uh, were housing for varying needs standards. That's risen to 99%. What I would say to Mr Balfour, uh, and I've listened very closely uh, to what stakeholders have had to say around about this, is that the Housing for Varia Needs standard itself um, is a, a little bit old now. It's coming up for 20 years old. Uh, I commit to reviewing that standard in the very near future so that we continue to build housing and deliver housing uh, which is fit uh, for purpose, not only for today for folks with uh, special needs, but also uh, for tomorrow. Question six, Alec Rowley. I preside an officer to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Shelter Scotland report, housing is a human right. Minister. Uh, President officer, we are committed to ensuring uh, Scotland is a modern, inclusive nation which protects, respects and realises internationally recognised human rights. The Scottish Government embraces constructive challenge and is happy to support action which pushes public institutions to go further in embedding human rights. Uh, in their recent report, the First Minister's Advisory Group on Human Rights Leadership recommended a new human rights framework for Scotland, uh, which would incorporate human rights treaty obligations, including the right to adequate housing into domestic law. The First Minister has welcomed the vision for how Scotland can show leadership on human rights. Scot Scotland itself already has some of the strongest rights in the world uh, for people facing homelessness uh, and we believe this gives the strong platform from which uh, we can do more. Our Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan demonstrates our commitment to housing as a human right, setting out how we will achieve our vision that everyone has a home that meets their needs and homelessness is ended. Alec Rowley. Uh, I thank the Minister for the answer. I think he's saying that, that that will be incorporated, but he can maybe confirm that, because as he says, the First Minister's Advisory Group on Human Rights published the report in December recommending a new Human Rights Act for Scotland. The question is, is that going ahead? And does he accept that the proposition for Shelter Scotland, that housing should be a central element of that new act? If he does, could he give us an update on the time frame for this legislation and is he making representation that housing will be a key part of that act? Minister. Um, President officer, uh, I can't give uh, Mr Rowley um, the time frame, uh, but the advisory group has been quite clear, uh, as has the First Minister in all of this. One of the key things that we must do at this moment in time, though, uh, is ensure that the human rights legislation that we have is protected uh, because that is very much under threat as far as I'm concerned uh, if we end up uh, in a situation with a hard Brexit or even a softer Brexit where we know uh, that the UK government has not made the commitment around about human rights. I think that over the piece this parliament has done very well under all political guises in government uh, and in terms of enshrining people's rights uh, and the homelessness legislation that we have shows that 
we can uh, and should go further uh, and I think in cooperation across the board uh, in this parliament we should be doing all that we can to protect human rights legislation that could very well be at risk in leaving the EU. Fulton McGregor if you're brief. Hey, thank you, President Officer. Um, can the, the Minister outline the work that has been undertaken to end homelessness and how this is affecting the long-term trend in homelessness applications? Minister. Um, President Officer, the Scottish Government is uh, fully committed uh, to tackling and preventing homelessness. Um, as the member will be aware, in November 2018, we published along with COSLA the Ending Homelessness Together High Level Action Plan uh, and that sets out our five-year programme uh, to end homelessness and transform uh, temporary accommodation in our country. That's backed by the £50 million Ending Homelessness Together Fund, uh, which will support the delivery of the action plan and help drive sustainable change. Um, the Ending Homelessness Together Fund is being targeted towards transformative projects, supporting local authorities and others, uh, and we have already allocated £23.5 million pounds from the fund and from the health portfolio for rapid rehousing and housing first, which can make transformational change. Question 7, Alison Harris. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what support is available to owners of former social housing units who face compulsory cosmetic upgrades to their buildings. Minister. Uh, President officer, owners who have acquired houses under the right to buy scheme are subject to the same rules uh, as other homeowners. The local authority can require them to carry out work on housing that is substandard, dangerous, defective, or in such a state as to be prejudicial to health or a nuisance. If they live in a tenement, they may also be obliged by a majority decision of other owners to contribute to common works to repair, maintain, or install insulation or carry out other work requi required under their title deeds. I don't believe that such works can fairly be described as cosmetic, but if an owner needs support, uh, the local authority has wide discretionary powers to provide assistance. It's for the local authority uh, to determine what kinds of assistance should be provided in different circumstances in accordance with local priorities and resources. Alison Harris. I thank the Minister for his answer. A constituent of mine who owns an ex-council flat which he rents out has recently contacted me to say that he is required to pay £12,000 for compulsory cosmetic upgrades, and that's the council's word, not mine, to the exterior of the building. He is not in a financial position to pay this and would struggle to secure a loan. He doesn't want to be put in a position where he has to evict tenants in order to sell the flat to cover these costs. He's now in a catch-22 position. When support is not available from the council, Sorry, can what you assistance just ask can question? the Scottish Government offer my constituent who cannot afford the five-figure bill? Thank you. Minister. Um, presiding officer, uh, it is very difficult for me to comment uh, on an individual case. Uh, by the signs of it, this is a landlord uh, in the private rented sector. Um, there are, depending on where uh, that person lives, uh, opportunities uh, for loan funding, but uh, I cannot comment any more on, on that. If Ms. Harris wants to write to me about this particular case, uh, I will look into it. But uh, as I say, each homeowner, uh, including private landlords, are responsible for their own properties. I'll have to be a quick question, a quick uh, reply, and a quick um, supplementary. Stuart Stevenson, number eight. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how much communities will receive from the re regeneration capital grant fund in 2019-20. Cabinet Secretary, briefly please. Uh, we were delighted to announce earlier in March that for 2019-20 a further 20 million would be invested in our communities through the Regeneration Capital uh, Grant Fund. This funding is offered to support locally led regeneration projects in our most disadvantaged and fragile communities across the country. Stuart Stevenson. Does the Cabinet Secretary expect that £20 million to be as successful as it has been in supporting projects like BAM Silversmiths and the Home Bakery in Macduff in projects right across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely, and importantly for that fund is that these projects and this fund enables local people to be in the lead, to be engaged with, to be listened to and responded to because it's those people, local communities and local organisations that know their spaces and places best. And that's the principle that underpins the RCGF and also the new, newly announced Town Centre Fund. And happy to engage further with the member around particular projects in his constituency. 
Thank you. That concludes questions in that section. I now move on to Social Security and Older People. Question 1, Graham Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government under what circumstances it would introduce a universal basic income. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. The Scottish Government is committed to reducing poverty and tackling inequality and we are interested in any proposal that would help us achieve that, including a citizen's basic income. We have invested 250,000 over 2018-19, 2019-20 to fund the feasibility study which will set out the ethical, legislative, financial and practical implementation of a basic income. Graham Simpson. Thank you. Europe's uh, first national government-backed citizens' income scheme in Finland has just been scrapped uh, and they found that it does not incentivise people into work. Uh, so does the minister think universal basic income is a realistic option here and will she take into account the reasons why Finland made their decision? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we'll take into account um, the evidence that is coming from um, across the chamber and my colleague Aileen Campbell, who leads on the Universal uh, Citizens Basic Income, um, will do just that. I have to say I'm rather disappointed by the member's tone to this one. Um, I compare that to Adam Tompkins, for example, in the Daily Record, who considered the uh, CBI a radical idea that could herald a revolution in social security provision and unite left and right. I think we should look at all options to be able to tackle poverty. We're doing that through the feasibility work that's going on with the four local authorities. The steering group is looking at all the evidence and we'll progress on the basis of the analysis of that evidence. And I hope that's something that all the chamber can get behind. Mark Ruskell, briefly. Right, Secretary, be aware of the strong support in Fife for a CBI pilot. However, there are concerns that the Scottish pilot could be scuppered due to a lack of cooperation from the DWP. What conversations has she had with her counterparts in the UK government regarding this pilot? What f further steps can she take to ensure that the DWP help rather than hinder us? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> As I say, this is actually an issue which um, Aileen Campbell is, is leading on from the government, but I, I know that there is um, a great, great degree of work that's going on with the DWP because it is absolutely imperative if this is to go forward that we have the cooperation from the UK government to be able to help build our understanding from that. Uh, we have had reassurances uh, from the Secretary of State uh, that she has offered cooperation and we are taking her very much up on that offer because we need to build an understanding of the scale and the scope of that work, but we need the UK government uh, to carry on that partnership with us on that process. Question two, Philip McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the most recent Social Security and Child Support Tribunal statistics regarding employment support allowance, disability living allowance, personal independence payment, personal independence payment, sorry, and universal credit appeals. Cabinet Secretary. Latest statistics from the Ministry of Justice show that from October to December 2018, 70% of appeals were found in favour of the claimant. That increased to 73% for cases involving PIP. These figures demonstrate that the system of decision making is effectively broken, leaving many vulnerable claimants facing a difficult and stressful journey as they apply for payments to which they are entitled. It's clear from these statistics that the DWP should look closely at its decision making process when impartial and independent scrutiny overturns so many decisions. Fulton McGregor. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for that response. And I know that many of my colleagues here will be like me and have countless constituents telling of their ordeal because that's exactly what it is dealing with the DWP. People with complex physical and mental health issues have been continually beaten down and often be traumatised by the system. Given the late statistics, um, as said there by the Cabinet Secretary, show that the majority of people are staggering 70% are actually winning their appeals. Does she think this further demonstrates the fundamental flaws at the heart of how the DWP operates? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I absolutely um, agree with Fulton McGregor's analysis and there is no uh, member within this chamber surely that has not heard these types of stories within uh, their own surgeries when we have people dealing with the DWP and particularly the assessment process. We are determined of course to have a completely different approach um, up here for the devolved benefits. We'll do all we can to reduce the number of vulnerable people going to appeals by ensuring that we get the right decision made at the initial stage of application. So that's getting the application process right, the desk-based decision making right and the face-to-face -face assessments only of information cannot be gathered in any other way that's right for the individual but it's also right for an agency fit for purpose question three claudia b to ask the scottish government 
what assistance it plans to provide to older carers of pensionable age providing care for over 35 hours per week. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is committed to building a system of support for all carers that recognises their needs and supports them to have a life as alongside caring. We will fully consult on our plans to introduce carers' assistance in Scotland. Any and all proposals to change carers' allowance will require to recognise that it is a benefit with a number of complex interactions with the reserve benefits, including pensions, and I will not make any changes without ensuring that these interactions are fully understood. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, older people age, aged uh, 65 and over are by far the largest group uh, providing care, but recent figures show that only 1% of the carers allowance supplement went to this group, as most pensioners only have an underlying entitlement. This additional payment could make a real difference to enabling pensioner carers to afford a few days respite in their retirement. Can the Cabinet Secretary set out what assessment has been made of paying the supplement to those with underlying entitlement and whether older carers can hope and expect for payment in the future? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I do uh, appreciate the point that, that Claudia Beamish is making, but I would uh, I, again refer her back to the points I was making in my original answer. Because of the overla overlapping benefit rule that the DWP retain responsibility for under the devolutionary setup, if we paid carers' assistance to pensioners, the DWP could see it as an overlapping benefit and reduce the benefits and entitlements in other areas, therefore leaving the carer uh, no better off. So I'm fairly committed to making making changes to uh, the carer's allowance and to social security payments when there's a clear case to do so. But we need to do that with a full recognition of the complex interactions that we have, particularly with the reserve benefit system, which we have no ability to control. And we cannot make any changes without that understanding of the interactions and the work that we must undertake jointly with the DWP to work through those. Question four, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it will take to promote more community engagement with elderly people given Scotland's ageing population. I don't think that's how it appears on the bulletin, but it's, um, so you should really read out what to have down as the question, unless I have the wrong question. Slight change to the phrasing, but never mind. Um, that's for the Minister. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government backs a wide range of community engagement activities to support our ageing population. I've had the real joy of visiting and meeting with many of them over the past few months. We have also introduced our National Social Isolation and Loneliness Strategy that prioritises community empowerment and recognises the impact on loneliness at every age and stage of life. We are also looking, uh, working locally with our partners, including Age Scotland, to directly support initiatives that promote active community engagement in later life, uh, such as the men's sheds and other organisations. Colin Beattie. I thank the Minister for her response. The Minister may be aware of initiatives in my constituency, such as the Holly's Drop-In Centre in Musselburgh or the Men's Shed in Mayfield. Can, can she outline what steps the Scottish Government will take to ensure such successful schemes will continue to thrive in both my constituency and across Scotland? Minister. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, I know very well from a previous life the, the real benefit that day centres uh, bring to local communities and the people who use them and men's sheds and the both of them pay, play key roles in supporting their local communities. The Scottish Government will continue to work with our partners, as I said earlier, to develop men's sheds, supporting the positive mental and physical health benefits that they provide. I'm also delighted to chair the first implementation group meeting of our innovative social isolation and loneliness strategy in April. Um, the strategy recognises the values of community initiatives of the that the member describes uh, and we will build on this work when we take it, it forward. We will also shortly publish the Older People's Framework informed by older people themselves. They have been in the driving seat of this the whole way which will tackle the negative perceptions of older people, highlight the contributions they make and tackle the barriers that they face. These types of initiatives play, in my opinion, a crucial role for some older people who may be at risk from social isolation and loneliness and I know that some of them have told me they've even saved their life. Question five, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government on what date it took the decision to delay the low light of a second wave of social security benefits. Cabinet Secretary. We will take full responsibility for the remaining devolved benefits from the 1st of April 2020. The timetable for delivery was determined after careful consideration of feedback from people with lived experience of the current system, who state very clearly that their priority is for their benefits to be delivered safely and securely. They also took on board the views of stakeholder organisations. The timetable agreed is ambitious but achievable and will protect people and their payments. It takes into account the joint nature of this project with the DWP, 
the need to link in with reserve benefits as well as the level of change required to make these benefits fit for purpose and in doing so deliver on our commitment to provide a system with dignity, fairness and respect. Jeremy Balfour, briefly please. Uh, I know disappointingly that the Cabinet Secretary still will not tell us what the exact date was, but would the Cabinet Secretary agree that the Scottish Government was never going to meet the 2021 target when consultation documents such as disability assistance and terminal illness have only just been launched and will she apologise to the disability community who are expecting these benefits to be devolved by 2021 and yet you have failed to meet that promise? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I said in my original answer to Jeremy Balfour, we will take full responsibilities for the remaining devolved benefits from the 1st of April 2020. But I will take no lecture from the Scottish Conservatives on how to run a welfare system. When we look at their counterparts in the DWP, we're six years too late for the universal credit rollout. They're three years over late for PIP, and we still don't know when that full um, application will begin. So I'll take no lectures from the Tories on how to run welfare. And it's because of the scale of change that we are needing to make, particularly in the disability benefits that we need to ensure that we get this right because we need to ensure that those who have been so badly affected by the treatment from the DWP will receive an entirely different treatment up here through Social Security Scotland. Months of detailed consideration has gone in with the engaging of stakeholders. The position papers that I launched on the 20th of February details a huge amount of detailed work that's gone on for planning for the next phase of delivery as well as our research with experienced panels and our um, expert advisory group advice that I've had. That's the basis for the 28th of February statement, and I'm proud that we will deliver a system based on dignity, fairness and respect. Question six, Shona Robinson. To ask the Scottish Government what impact UK Government welfare reforms have had on women in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. The UK Government's welfare reforms have had a disproportionate impact on women who are twice as dependent on Social Security as men. Analysis by the UK Human Rights Commission estimates that the cumulative impact of tax and welfare changes since 2010 falls disproportionately on women. On average, women were estimated to lose £940 per year compared to £460 per year for men by 2021-22. The benefit cap, the two-child limit and its abhorrent rape clause also impact women disproportionately. Indeed, Philip Alston, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, said the UK government's welfare system may as well have been created by a group of misogynists in a room. Uh, Ms Robinson, briefly, please. Thank you. Uh, is the Cabinet Secretary concerned, as I am, that because of the lack of transitional protection for those who naturally migrate to universal credit, for example, when they have a change of address, that this could have an adverse impact, and that it may force women to stay in abusive relationships so that they don't lo lose those funds for them and their families? Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely, I agree with Shona Robinson that it's very concerning that women who are forced onto universal credit without transitional protection now face further barriers to leaving abusive relationships. We will continue to urge the UK government to halt the natural migration onto universal credit because thousands of people are losing out on transitional protection while none of the fundamental flaws of universal credit have been dealt with. The Scottish Government is also concerned that the UK Government's policy of making a single payment of universal credit to a household can act as, as an enabler for domestic abuse. And we're working with the DWP to identify how best we can introduce split payments on universal credit in Scotland to give women access to independent income. Question 7, Alison Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what input disabled people, disabled persons, organisations and other stakeholders will have into the design of the assessment descriptors for disability assistance for working age people. Cabinet Secretary. Disabled people and their carers have had significant input into the development of disability assistance in Scotland. Their experience and views have helped us to shape the proposed policy changes outlined in the consultation on disability assistance. The consultation invites views on all of the activities and descriptors associated with disability assistance for working age people and this will provide an opportunity for disabled people, disabled people's organisations and stakeholders across Scotland to input into the design of this policy. Alison Johnson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. Um, may I ask whether the Scottish Government shares concerns that the PIP criteria aren't always appropriate for people with mental health conditions and how will it be working with people with those people and organisations representing them to ensure the descriptors for disability assistance are fair? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Alison Johnson is uh, quite right to point out the concerns um, that people have had about the 
current system under PIP that it doesn't deal adequately with mental health conditions or indeed fluctuating conditions as well. And that's uh, something which uh, we're very cognizant of as we move forward with this. Um, it's very, very important as we move through the consultation um, responses that we ensure that what we're building is fit for purpose for every single case that will come forward. Um, and I'm happy to work with Alison Johnson and with stakeholders in this area to ensure that we get this right um, under our replacement for PIP, particularly those with mental health and fluctuating conditions that have been so badly served under the current system. Question 8, Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made on delivering additional payments of the Best Start grant to help with early learning costs. Cabinet Secretary. So we're on track to deliver both the early learning and school age payments by summer 2019. On the 6th of March, Parliament approved the regulations which create the new payments. We continue to build the IT systems needed to, pr to process the applications and make payments to eligible individuals. Social Security Scotland are currently recruiting and training the staff who will provide operational support. Mary Fee. I thank the Minister for that answer. To ensure that the nursery and early learning payment delivers for children, how will the Scottish Government assess what the payment is being used for and how will it reach the most vulnerable children, such as children of prisoners, BME children or gypsy traveller children? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we don't assess how um, people or make any requirements on how people will use their payments. It is for the individual to decide how to use their payment um, as, as it is their um, entitlement. Uh, but many of you rec um, brings up a, a very important point about ensuring that we get uh, the, the process right to ensure that all demographics and all part of Scotland's population are aware of the payments um, and ensure that they get support to apply for those. So as we did with the pregnancy and baby payments, uh, we'll take very seriously our obligations to encourage take up and ensure that that not only works for the majority of, of applicants, but that we're looking at the particular demographics, for example, the gypsy travellers communities or the BMA communities. And that's a, an aspect which we're determined to get right. Uh, I'm more than happy, as I said on a, a number of occasions on this, to work with members, including Mary Fee, of their particular aspects around communication that she would like us to look at on that, because I realise it's important uh, that we, we get that right um, and we are open to learning on that process. Thank you. That concludes questions on Social Security and older people. We have a short pause to allow the front benches to take their place to the next item of business.